This lecture is on spinal cord lesions and this particular image is really good and I'd like you to look at this image frequently. You know, after you listen to the entire narration, look at this image and see everything that is given. On this side, your the tracks are mentioned and on this side, it tells you the effects when any of the tracks is damaged. For example, if the fasciculus gracilis is damaged, you can see that it tells you that there will be an ipsilateral loss of tactile discrimination and position and vibration sense from the leg. And along with this, you can also add stereognosis because remember, I'm very fond of this and this is a very important um, thing that is lost when the uh, dorsal columns are lost. So make sure you come back to this uh, this particular slide after you are done with the narration and you must understand everything in this. Now before we go further I'd like to tell you what we mean by ipsilateral loss and contralateral loss. So what happens is that suppose there is let's say that this is the spinal cord and uh, this is the central division. So let's say that there is a lesion present here in the spinal cord. And this is obviously the left side and this is the right side. So when we talk about the effect scene, the neurological deficit scene, and we say ipsilateral loss, that means ipsilateral means on in this, when we're talking about lesions, it means there is the le the de deficit is on the same side as the lesion. So in this case, if I tell you that, for example, there will be ipsilateral loss of stereognosis or ipsilateral loss of uh, vibration sense, that means that there will be all of those losses will be seen on the left side because the lesion is on the left side. Then when we say there is contralateral deficit, it means it is on the, op this is opposite to the side of the lesion. So it is opposite side. So that means, so I would say that suppose I told you that there was contralateral loss of pain and temperature. So that means the loss would be on the right side. Okay. So that is what, when we talk about lesions and we say there is ipsilateral loss, that means it's on the same side as where the lesion occurs. So if we are looking at the lesion on the left side, then the loss is on the left side. If it is a contralateral deficit or contralateral loss of any sensation or motor activity, then the loss is felt on the side opposite to that of the lesion. So this is very important for you to understand when you're doing lesions. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's move to the next one. And here we are describing the motor neurons. And if you remember in the last lecture, I, when we were doing the spinal cord, I'd already in detail told you about upper motor neurons. These were neurons which began, so they were the point of origination of the descending tracks. So these were neurons which either began in the cerebral cortex or these were neurons which began in the brainstem. For example, in the brainstem from this red nucleus, this is the red nucleus, certain fibers will travel down this way as a descending tract and we call that tract, we, we will call it rubrospinal tract because from red nucleus, rubro to the spinal cord. So you can see by the name itself, rubrospinal, rub, red nucleus to spinal cord, so it has to go down. Similarly, there are other tracks, for example, there will be vestibular nuclei, which you see in relation to the medulla. So somewhere here are vestibular nuclei. So a tract which travels down would be called vestibulospinal. Then there, in the, from the reticular formation, that will be called reticulospinal. So the upper motor neurons would be neurons which begin in the cerebral cortex or in the brainstem. Now those that give rise to these 
a fib most of which take origin from this motor cortex and then you have a few which take origin from these other areas remember we called all of these fibers we called these the corticospinal fibers and or corticonuclear if they ended as you can see here if they ended this are the corticonuclear the corticonuclear when they ended on the cranial nerve nuclei so these were corticospinal fibers which are upper motor neuron and then the brain stem uh, the fibers which originate from certain brain stem nuclei those also are the upper motor neuron fibers in addition to this apart from these corticospinal fibers there are fibers which originate from different areas um, you know they uh, arise from different parts of the brain so they may arise from uh, the frontal lobe certain fibers which come down there may be uh, fibers which come down from the temporal lobe um, uh, these fibers which do not belong to the corticospinal and they include these brain stem fibers we actually sometimes call them extra pyramidal fibers so here i'm going to repeat this and tell you that the upper motor neurons so let's just use this other page the upper motor neuron fibers let's take another page here so we have upper motor neuron fiber so the first thing we said is that they can arise from the cerebral cortex or they can arise from the brain stem from different nuclei in the brain stem the second thing that we said was the ones which arise from the cerebral cortex and most of which arose from that motor area and then uh, the other ones part which lie close by the supplementary motor area the superior parietal lobule and so on we called these the corticospinal or the corticonuclear fibers there are other fibers which arise from the cerebral cortex and those which arise from the brain stem we don't call them corticospinal instead we just call them descending tracks or sometimes you might see these being called extra pyramidal tracks or extra pyramidal fibers and that rubrospinal vestibulospinal and so on belong to this they're called extra pyramidal because they don't lie in that pyramid of the medulla plus they don't take origin from certain large cells in the motor cortex which are known as pyramidal cells so let's go back to our powerpoints and now look at lower motor neurons so lower motor neurons were neurons which began either in the anterior horn cells as we see here in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord or in the cranial nerve nuclei so you can see here in those cranial nerve nuclei which send out branches to the skeletal muscles in the head and neck area so these are lower motor neurons so this is this should be a review for uh, you because we've done this when we did the spinal cord now when we look at the motor neurons and see the correlation between the upper and the lower motor neurons again if you remember i told you that the lower motor neurons especially the anterior horn cells which you see here so these are the anterior horn cells these were influenced by a lot of fibers which come from above so they were influenced by these upper motor neurons and the uh, of course the upper motor neurons especially the corticospinal tract which you see here that corticospinal tract this was the point of origin from the cortex it traveled down and came and then synapsed on the anterior horn cell or the corticonuclear synapsed on the cranial nerve nuclei so this is one of the upper motor neurons which synapses on the anterior horn cell 
and this corticospinal fiber actually it stimulates the anterior horn cell in fact it provides the direction or the impulse or the stimulation for the anterior horn cell so that then the anterior horn cell can act and go and supply the muscle all of the other upper motor neurons and these are the ones which come from other areas other than the motor cortex and you know other than the fibers which give rise to the corticospinal fibers so here you can see them these are the reticulospinal fibers the rubrospinal the vestibulospinal and all of these these all of these fibers um, not this one this exclude this but these these fibers these are those which we call the extra pyramidal extra pyramidal fibers and they were coming from this brain stem nuclei so the red nucleus for example is present in the midbrain the reticular formation is present in the entire brain stem the vestibulospinal is present in the medulla and so on so on so these were coming from the brain stem nuclei and if you remember, I've been telling you that most of these upper motor neurons have an inhibitory effect on the anterior horn cells. And it is these extra pyramidal fibers which actually have an inhibitory effect on the anterior horn cells. Or they have a breaking action on the anterior horn cells, much like this Renshaw cell which you see here. So the Renshaw cell and these extra pyramidal have a breaking action and the corticospinal they are the ones which kind of stimulate the anterior horn cell. Now, there's a reason why I'm telling you all this, and we'll see this when we go to the next slide, where we are looking at the lesions. So, there is a, if there is an injury in the upper motor neuron fi uh, fibers or in the up area where it actually begins, in the cells of the upper motor neuron or in those tracks which come from the upper motor neuron the lesion will be different the neurological deficit will be different as when it occurs in the anterior horn cells or cranial nerve nuclei or the nerves itself so let me again define this so let's go back and look at the where upper motor neur neuron lesions can occur so they can occur in the cells itself, which means they can occur here in the gray matter, in the cells itself or in these brainstem nuclei, or they can occur in these tracks. That means not on the cells, but as these tracks are coming down, so anywhere here they can occur, or from this red nucleus or, you know, those vestibulospinal as those tracks were coming down, as, um, as up here in this, here, so here it could involve any of this so this would be where an upper motor neuron lesion can occur a lower motor neuron lesion can occur again either in the cells which means it can occur in the uh, in the cranial nerve nuclei in those cells of the cranial nerve nuclei or in the cells of the anterior horn or it can occur in the cranial nerve itself or in the spinal nerves as these nerves come out the motor fibers in the in the nerve as they're com coming out so they can occur there so any of these places can give rise to the lower motor neuron and i've already described the upper motor neuron now let's look at what the effects of the lesions are one when we uh, when the upper motor neuron lesion uh, when it is an upper motor neuron lesion usually it's a vascular stroke which involves of the fibers and the corticospinal fibers are often involved in strokes and especially in the internal capsule if you remember i told you of uh, the internal capsule was where these fibers pass through so usually strokes in are occur in the internal capsule and there these upper motor neuron tra or descending tracts are affected now if the corticospinal tract is affected then what happens is that the corticospinal tracts are responsible and let me again go back to this slide so these corticospinal tracts they come down this way and then they come and synapse on the anterior horn cell and so they kind of monitor the activity of the anterior horn cell, cell stimulated and then the anterior horn cell goes out and supplies the muscle or if it's the cranial nerve nucleus, then it will go and supply the muscle, the skeletal muscle in the head and neck region. 
Now, when this tract is damaged, what happens is that you get a paralysis because voluntary movements will not occur because there is no input coming from the top. So the anterior horn cells have no direction at all. So when the corticospinal tracts are involved, voluntary movements are absent or weak. Now, this will depend where the lesion occurs. So if you remember these corticospinal tracts, so let's draw the brain up here. So these corticospinal tracts, which began here, most of them in the motor cortex, you remember they traveled down and then they crossed over. So, if this, let's say, um, let me draw this again, so, so that it's easier for you to understand. So, I'll draw it this way. So, this is the cerebral hemisphere and this is the brain stem and the spinal cord. So, when, these, when the tracks start from here, these are the cells and as these tracks start, then they cross over and they form that pyramidal decussation. And only a few fibers remain on this side. Remember 20%. And of this 20%, the rest 10% cross, crossed at the local level. So depending on if the lesion occurs above this pyramidal decussation. So suppose the lesion occurs here at this point. What will happen is this is the side of lesion, which is the right side. But the effect will be seen on the left side because this is destined for muscles of this side or anterior horn cells of this left side and those anterior horn cells go to the muscles of the left side. So the lesion is then seen, uh, the lesion is seen on the right side, the effect is contralateral. So then we'll say that the if the lesion occurs bef before the pyramidal decussation, the signs are seen on the contralateral side. But if the lesion occurs here after the pyramidal decussation, then the effect is seen on the ipsilateral side, on the same side as the lesion. So the signs and symptoms will be seen on the ipsilateral side. So that's what is meant by whether it occurs above or below the pyramidal decussation. Now initially when, the, when this kind of a lesion occurs, there's something known as a spinal shock and there is flaccid paralysis. Flaccid means it's a a floppy kind of paralysis. There is no tone in the muscle. So flaccid means there is a floppy type of paralysis. And there is absolute loss of reflexes at that time. And this is known as spinal shock. Depending on where the lesion is, you may have loss of uh, one half or, the, or you may have paralysis of one half of the body, which is known as hemiplegia. And this hemiplegia will usually occur if, for example, the as the fibers are coming down, say all these fibers in the internal capsule, all the corticospinal fibers are involved up here in the cerebral cortex itself. You can see that these are for supply of the body. So that's the head like this. So these fibers are going to supply all of this region. So if it's cut over here, the entire half of the body suffers. So that is known as hemiplegia. Monoplegia would be if, for example, only a small portion is affected. So it could be up here or even in the spinal cord. So suppose in the spinal cord where we have the corticospinal fibers, So, you know, you have the corticos, lateral corticospinal tract. So, if the corticospinal tract is, uh, if the, it occurs only a small part is affected, you would have monoplegia. Quadriplegia is when all four limbs are affected. So, you know, that is, for example, there is a complete transection of the spinal cord. It have, you know, it's totally transected in the cervical region, then what happens is that neither the upper nor the lower limbs will get any supply. So that will be when quadriplegia is, effect, is uh, seen. And paraplegia is seen when the two lower limbs are affected. And this will occur when the transection occurs at the lower level, at the lumbar region. So the upper limbs are spared, but the lower limbs, um, they suffer. So that is what is, uh, these are the terms which are used. Now in this uh, in upper motor neuron lesions, you see what is known as spasticity. Spasticity means there is an increase in muscle tone. And 
tone means the resistance to passive movement. So there is an increase in resistance to passive movement. And why spasticity is seen is that corticospinal lesions by themselves do not lead to spasticity. But usually it's never a simple case of just corticospinal fibers being involved. Often when, when uh, this kind of lesion occurs, Along with these corticospinal fibers, you usually have a lot of these extra pyramidal fibers which are involved. And those extra pyramidal fibers, remember, had a negative or inhibitory effect on the anterior horn cells. So when that inhibitory effect is gone, what happens is there is overzealous contraction. So there is overzealous contraction uh, by the muscles because those anterior horn cells have come out of that breaking effect and um, the stretch reflexes become hyperactive. And most often the spasticity affects the anti-gravity muscles. For example, in the lower limbs, it affects the extensors of the knee and the plantar flexors. And in the upper limb, it affects the flexors of the elbow and the wrist. So the reason again for the spasticity is that the upper motor or sorry the anterior horn cells or the motor neurons become hyper excitable as the inhibitory effect is gone and that inhibitory effect is because of GABA the neurotransmitter GABA so this is uh, this is the reason so that inhibitory effect is gone. So let's go back to our slide and see the other um, signs that we see there is hypertonia which i already mentioned that there is an increase in tone of the muscle because the muscle now becomes oh, there's, there's an overzealous contraction since it has come out of that uh, inhibitory effect there is hyperreflexia the hyperreflexia is again because of the same thing and just to show you why let's go back to this slide and notice this is that reflex arc over here and then the anterior horn cell going to the muscle so this reflex this tendon reflex these are at the spinal level so when this effect when this is knocked off so then again it comes out of its breaking action so these reflexes now become overactive so that's why we have the hyper reflexia and then we have we also have a loss of superficial reflexes these superficial reflexes are the abdominal reflex, the chromasteric reflex, and the plantar reflex. These are what are called superficial reflexes. The abdominal reflex is when the skin over the anterior abdominal wall is just kind of gently scratched you can see a contraction of the abdominal muscles these reflexes all of these superficial reflexes are protective in nature the cremastric reflex is when the inner aspect or the medial aspect of the thigh in a male is uh, gently stroked there is contraction of the cremastric muscle which pulls the testes up and out of harm's way and the plantar the normal plantar reflex is that when you scratch uh, the sole of the foot so if you take the foot in this fashion and you scratch the sole of the foot this is the big toe and you scratch the sole of the foot in this direction from lateral to medial side usually there is a, a flexion of the toes and the toes kind of curl in now in in uh, upper motor neuron lesions the abdominal and the chromastric reflex is gone and the plantar reflex actually becomes what is called an extensor reflex. And this is the extensor reflex. That means when you scratch the foot along the lateral, the sole of the foot along the lateral side and then go on to the medial side, instead of the toes curling in, they actually uh, curl out and spread out. And that is known as the Babinski's response. And that is positive and that is because of the extra pyramidal fibers. Then we also see clonus on dorsi flexion. Uh, clonus is when the muscle kind of keeps contracting for a short time. It's a repetitive contraction of flexor muscles about 5 to 10 uh, per second. 
and that's seen in the wrist and ankle again because of the hyper excitability of the motor neurons. Now in lower motor neuron lesions, most of the lower motor neuron lesions, uh, as I said, they are because of involvement of the anterior horn cells or the cranial nerve nuclei or the cranial nerves or the spinal nerves itself. Now polio usually affects the anterior horn cells and it affects the anterior horn cells which serve the lower limb. So that's why when you see a case of polio, usually the lower limbs are affected. And here you have a flaccid kind of flaccid again, meaning a floppy type of paralysis. Because what happens is, so this let's say is the upper motor neuron which is coming down and this is the lower motor neuron, the anterior horn cell or cranial nerve nuclei and this is the one which goes to the muscle. So that's the muscle. Now if this is knocked off at any point, there is no impulse going to the muscle. So the muscle cannot contract at all. So there is, there is none of that local reflex also from the muscle spindle and coming down because one part of the circuit is gone. So since the muscle cannot contract it on at all, it becomes flaccid and that's what is known as flaccid or floppy paralysis. You also see areflexia or absence of reflexes. And the reason is for any of these tendon reflexes to occur, you have this pathway must be, it must be uh, okay. So this limb must be working properly as must this limb. So while this limb is working properly, this part is affected. So then therefore the reflexes uh, don't occur. So there is absence of reflexes and that's known as areflexia. Yeah? The muscles begin to atrophy because they are not getting any stimulus to them. And because they, they are not contracting, you often get what is known as disuse atrophy. And that's why physiotherapy is very important in people who have this kind of paralysis. So you have to artificially stimulate the muscle so that um, you, uh, you know, provide it with some sort of stimulus so that it's able to contract. So that's why we, you know, atrophy of muscles occurs and we want to prevent that. And if muscles are allowed to atrophy, you might end up with something which are known as contractures. Then the other thing that we see are uh, fasciculations. Uh, fasciculations are twitching which is due to spontaneous discharge of the motor neurons with activation of motor units. So there are some motor neurons which may be okay. So they discharge spontaneously. You may also see something which is known as fibrillation. And fibrillation is, they are minute contractions which are only detectable by electromyography. And this is because of super sensitivity and probably additional acetylcholine receptors develop. And that's why this fibrillation occurs. Now, sometimes you will see a recovery of function and voluntary movements tend to come back. And this is because of the progressive increase in influence of the ipsilateral motor cortex on the 10% of uncrossed fibers in the anterior corticospinal tract. So to explain what I'm saying, so let's look here at this. So here we have the cerebral cortex. And and then this is the spinal cord. So we had fibers which came from here and they traveled down, they crossed 80%, they came down this way. And then we had 20% which came this way and of this 20%, 10% crossed over. So we still had 10% on this side. So this was 10% on this side. So now let us say for example this was damaged. So then obviously this side would go, all of this would go. But remember we have fibers which are on this, so on. we would see in this, so I said that this was damaged, so let's say this was the right side, and this is the left side. So I say there's a lesion on the right side and then we in if it's occurring here you can see that you would have contralateral upper motor neuron paralysis. 
on the left side, right? Because this, these 80%, the, the right side controls most of the left side, that 80% crosses over and then 10 crosses over here. So you have contralateral upper motor neuron paralysis on the left side. Often what will happen is you'll tend to see that there'll be a recovery of function on the left side. It was paralyzed initially, but slowly there, you might find a recovery. The reason is because the fibers which come from this side, so let's say these fibers which are coming, which are crossing over like this, here, and going on this side, they have 20% here of this 20%, 10 will cross, but remember 10 is going to remain on this side. So 10% on the left side is intact because it is being served by the left cortex. So this influence of this left cortex, the 10% which is there, that progressively in, increases and that is responsible for the recovery of function in many people that you see because this influence, this 10% is not affected on this side. So that's what um, helps the person recover some function because there's an increasing influence on this side. So I hope that's clear. I know this image looks a little, um, it, it kind of looks a little shabby. So let me, if you want, let me just draw it again for you and explain it again. So I'm just going to draw instead of drawing so many fibers let me draw just a few so here this is one fiber which came crossed over went on this side part of it remained uncrossed and then remember a little bit went over here so this so you can see that on the left side 90 percent would be affected if this was damaged but on the left side what also happens is it's got fibers which came from here now these guys crossed over and went on this side 20 percent remained on this side and of that 10 went there but you still had 10 percent so you can see this 10 percent is still intact because this side is normal so because of the progressive influence of this 10 percent you might have recovery of function so that's the reason now, they say that in right-handed individuals, the, if there is a lesion on the right, on, on a right-handed individual, the left side, the left cerebral hemisphere is kind of dominant. So in right-handed individuals, the left cerebral hemisphere is dominant. We'll, we'll, we'll see this later when we um, do uh, the cerebral hemispheres. But right now, for now, just... Um, you know, take this as gospel truth. Uh, the, and right-handed individuals, the left cerebral hemisphere is dominant, which means that the right side has, um, you know, doesn't have the fibers which come from the right side. Uh, they doesn't, you know, those 10% of fibers which come from the right side, which is this, these 10% which are not crossed, which remain on the same side, they don't make a very significant contribution. And um, again, let me just draw this just to show you this again. In right-handed individuals, so in right-handed individuals, I said the left cerebral hemisphere was more dominant. So crosses over, and I'm just going to show this as thick. This remains on the same side. This right side okay so here you can see that in right-handed in, uh, uh, individuals, the right-sided hemiplegias are more disabling. The right-sided hemiplegia means that if there is uh, a damage to the, you know, there is a lesion on this, on this side and the hemiplegia is seen on the right side. So the lesion can be here. So the hemiplegia is seen on this side. So on the right-sided hemiplegia.
is is uh, is more disabling and the patients often report clumsiness on the left side also because what happens is that on the left side can you see that this while it is being controlled by the right corticos uh, on the left side while it's being controlled by this right corticospinal fibers remember i just said that this left side is making these left uncrossed fibers are making a significant contribution on the left side so if this is knocked off even these will be knocked off so a good bit they are they report clumsiness on the left side also and because these right fibers from here see how na how very little influence it has so the recovery of function is very little on this side so if there is a right sided hemiplegia in right handed people uh, it is a little more disabling and the reason for that is this now let's get back to our PowerPoint and let's look at some combined upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesions and this uh, one very common disease that you will see and you must have heard of is what is known as amyotropic lateral sclerosis so ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis a the word a means no myo means muscle trophic if you remember means nourishment or nutrition lateral of course is lateral sclerosis means scarring and hardening and that occurs in the lateral areas so that's why this is called a myotrophic lateral sclerosis and in the US it's also called Lou Gehrig's disease after a baseball player it's only in in America that we call it Lou Gehrig's disease in other parts of the world it's just known as ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis now this is a chronic progressive degenerative disease and the etiology is not known and this affects primarily the corticospinal and the corticonuclear uh, tracts along with that is the upper motor neuron part of it so affecting the corticospinal or the corticonuclear tracts that's the upper motor neuron part of it and then it also affects the cranial nerves either their nuclei or the nerves and it affects the anterior horn cells and that's the lower motor neuron part of it the anterior horn cells so here this is what you can see so here I've put a, a sort of a cross here to show you that this is the part where the corticospinal fibers are lying. So it's affecting the corticospinal fibers, which is upper motor neuron, and it's affecting the anterior horn cells, which are present here. So that's the lower motor neuron. Now this typically, as you can see here, occurs in middle in uh, middle age, um, and during the first year or so, the it's usually the lower motor signs of muscular atrophy there's loss of tendon reflexes and uh, fasciculations are seen and you know wasting as I've given you in your notes is not only because of if since it's lower motor neuron you have disuse atrophy but there is failure of that trophic factors to reach the muscle through axonal transport so that also contributes to it later when uh, uh, signs of upper motor neuron disease occur most of the time the cranial nerve nuclei are involved and that's why you get signs of dysphagia sometimes respiratory failure can occur sometimes you might have respiratory failure and you know if respiratory failure occurs this is due to paralysis of the diaphragm so it you know if it involves the cervical region um, and usually patients have wasted muscles they have very thin arms and legs and the unfortunate part of this is that the person is slowly being paralyzed but their intellect and their sensations are okay so they are able to think and feel everything so their sensations are okay but they just cannot do anything and it is it becomes extremely difficult for the caregivers to you know see someone they love go through this whole um, this whole situation 
nowadays it's usually fatal in two or six years but nowadays fortunately people are living a little longer and um, you know uh, the research is being done to see how this disease can um, you know something some sort of a cure can be achieved for this disease the next condition we are going to see is now we are going to move on to sensory loss and in sensory loss we are first going to look at the dorsal column lesions which means we are looking at the fasciculus gracilis and uh, fasciculus cuneatus. Uh, one uh, condition that I have described is the stabes dorsalis. This is often seen uh, because it's, uh, it's caused by syphilis and uh, in this, uh, it, it involves the dorsal columns, but it also involves the dorsal roots as well. So if you remember the spinal cord, and that's the gray matter, the central canal, and here is the dorsal root, and that's the ventral root. So this dorsal columns as well as this dorsal root might be involved. So this area might be involved. And... In this uh, tabes dorsalis or in a dorsal column lesion, we often call it sensory ataxia. Ataxia means incoordination and here the incoordination is because the sensory input has gone. And this is in contrast to cerebellar ataxia which is known as motor ataxia. So let us see what are some of the things that we, we see in this. There is uh, something known as Romberg sign and Romberg sign in, in Tabes dorsalis what happens is that if the person, you ask the person um, to you know walk in a straight line, they are not able to walk if their eyes are closed but if their eyes are open, they can you know walk properly in a straight line because the visual input is there. And you'll see that in cerebellar ataxia, whether the eyes are closed or the eyes are open, they tend to sway when, you know, they're asked to stand with their feet together or they walk, are asked to walk in a straight line. So here, with their eyes open, they can do that because the visual input is there so they can correct themselves. But if their eyes are closed, then they tend to sway. Then they lose their, uh, their, um, uh, the sense of tactile discrimination. They cannot identify numbers which are drawn on the hand. Uh, they have what is known as a stereognosis. So stereognosis is affected and when that is affected, we call it a stereognosis. That means no stereognosis is present. So a stereognosis, so they cannot differentiate between objects of similar shape or texture. You can And you can see why all this will happen. This is because... These are the sensations which are carried by the dorsal columns and, you know, they fail the finger nose test and the heel shin or the toe line, that test is affected. Again, here, if their eyes are open, they can do these tests because the visual input is there. So the visual input is there. So when the eyes are open, they're able to touch their finger to their nose of the heel to their shin and the toe, you know, they can uh, walk, as I said, in a straight line. But um, when the eyes are closed, they cannot, they cannot do that. The reason being, big, they have no idea of position. So that's why they're not able to, uh, to do that. And in ta another thing in Tabes dorsalis, usually there's destruction of uh, nerve fibers and this affects the lower thoracic and the lumbosacral region. So often the, you will find that the affectation is seen in the lower limbs. Now these people have a typical what is known as stamp and stick gait. So whichever side is affected and in this case uh, this person's right side is affected. What will happen is that they, you know, they have to walk with a stick because they are incoordinated. And they lift their foot very high up and they stamp it down because they want to get as much of the proprioceptive impulse as possible from the, you know, hitting their joints because they can't feel anything, uh, no sensations, vibration or po joint or position sense is there. So these people kind of, if they feel, if they stamp their foot down hard, they can make the maximum use of some of the receptors which may be surviving. So uh, that's why they have this stamp and stick gait. Let's look at the next 
uh, sensory loss and this is no this is uh, a condition which is known as syringomyelia syringomyelia is when the central canal of the uh, spinal cord that kind of become the cavity keeps enlarging in size and forms a cyst which is known as a syrinx usually this occurs in the brain stem and the cervical region of the spinal cord uh, which is why you see this shawl like distribution in the you know where you wear that's why it's called the shawl like distribution of a neurological deficit because you know when you wear a shawl you wear it over your shoulder so that is in the cervical and the uh, cervical region now here what happens is that as you can see in this image if you look here the this is the region of the central canal as the central canal is enlarging in size what happens is it interrupts these fibers which are crossing in front of the central canal and if you remember i told you those fibers which formed the anterolateral system which was the a a lateral spinothalamic and anterior spinothalamic tracts they crossed in front of the central canal so this one is crossing uh, from this is coming from the right and crossing over to the left and then here this is the one on the left side so you can see this will cross over and go here so these fibers as the syrinx gets larger so you can see it is it is going to affect the fibers crossing so it affects fibers of both sides so that's why you can see that it's uh, it since it's affecting fibers of both sides you get this shawl like um uh, distribution and what is the loss that is seen these are fibers which are carrying pain and temperature and pain and temperature and they are carrying crude touch because fine or discriminative touch was carried by these dorsal columns which are present here so there is total loss of pain and temperature in this in the areas which have been affected and as i said this since it's seen in the cervical region of the spinal cord those fibers which are crossing for those segments those will be affected so that's why you see this shawl like distribution and there is partial uh, loss of touch because fine touch is maintained so we call this dissociated anesthesia because dissociated anesthesia means that you feel some sensations but lose others so you lose pain and temperature totally so pain and temperature are totally gone but some touch is preserved since that dorsal column is intact so that's why we have this what is called dissociated anesthesia or dissociated sensory loss now if the syrinx as you can see or if the syrinx gets larger and you can see it it if it's going to travel in the region of the anterior horn then at that time you might have a uh, lower motor neuron lesion because the anterior horn cells are affected and these will be seen in the small muscles of the hand why in the small muscles again because it's the cervical region of the spinal cord and this cervical region of the spinal cord the nerve fibers which come out from the anterior horn cells they go to supply the muscles of the hand the tiny muscles present in the hand so that's why you have lower motor neuron type of lesion in the small muscles of the hand if the syrinx travels in such a way that it involves the anterior horn cells now let's look at the next slide where we are looking at both motor and sensory loss now when we describe motor and sensory loss you will notice in your notes that you have ipsi what happens on the ipsilateral side and what happens on the contralateral side so again just to show you this let us look up here so um uh, let's say that this is so let's see how this works so let us take the spinal cord and i'm going to draw a really wide spinal cord going all the way up only because um only because i want to so that I, the diagram doesn't get too busy so i'm just showing a part of the spinal cord and let's say these are the various spinal segments the arbitrary segments that we draw and this is the midline so you understand that these are the arbitrary segments and so i'm going to now after having drawn that i'm going to erase these so that again we don't have too many lines here
So I want to explain what happens when there is a lesion and how we describe ipsilateral and contralateral on the side of the lesion and on the opposite side of the lesion. So let's so we know that this is the right side and this is the left side. So now let me look at some tracks. So let us say that we had let's first look at sensory tracks. So we know that the dorsal columns in the spinal cord they come in they go on the same side, they travel up this way. So these are sensory tracts. The spinothalamic tract, so this was dorsal column. Now let's look at the spinothalamic tract. That spinothalamic tract came in, it synapsed in the dorsal horn, and from here a fiber started out and went off to the other side. So this is the anterolateral system or the spinothalamic tract. Now I'm going to draw the spinothalamic for this side also just to show you. I could draw the dorsal columns but I'm not going to. So this is the anterolateral system on this side. So this goes over this way. So again this is the anterolateral system. This is for pain and temperature, the dorsal columns for stereognosis and everything else. Now, let's say that um, we have the descending tracks. So, the descending tracks are, so they've already, they're coming from the top. They've already crossed over. So, I'm going to just say they've already crossed over. So, they're traveling on this side and they come down and they come down. So, this is their direction. They synapse on the anterior horn cell and then the anterior horn cell goes out. So, here, let's say, at this level, I want to show you. So again, here, there's these descend. Some of these descending fibers, they are synapsing on an anterior horn cell a little higher up. That's going out. Let's pretend that this and this is at the same level. That means I'm drawing these fibers at the same level. Now, let's say that we had a lesion and the lesion occurred at just to show you the lesion occurred at this point so this is where the lesion occurs so remember this was one half of the spinal cord so this half is normal so now let's look at what are the tracks which are going to be affected so first is so let's say this this lesion was at c4 okay this was the spinal segment c4 so this lesion occurred at c4 and one half of the spinal cord was cut this way and this the right half was cut so you know there was a knife wound and that knife wound went across this way and cut it through so just so that you let me just use a different color so it doesn't confuse it. This is the knife goes through and cuts it at this level, this way. So it's cut it. So let's see what all has been interrupted. So let's look at the sensory tracks first. So you can see that this dorsal column, it's going up. This dorsal column got affected over here. But any dorsal column higher above C4, that'll go up. So that'll be normal. But all the fibers in the dorsal column below C4, all of them, so anything that started below also as it goes up, that would be affected. So we can see that below C4, so since the lesion as is at C4, so we'll say below the level of lesion. So that means below C4. The dorsal columns are affected and when the dorsal columns are affected, those sensations that they carry, those will be affected. So we'll say that dorsal, the dorsal columns are affected and these dorsal, these fibers are carrying impulses from the right side because they haven't crossed. So the, it's from the right side of the body that these impulses are being carried. Where is the lesion? 
on the right side. So these dorsal columns are affected on the ipsilateral side. So that means they are affected on the side of the lesion. So we can see that on the same side as the lesion, there will be loss of stereognosis, uh, vibration, all of that. And where is that loss going to be? Below C4. That means below the level of lesion. Now let's see what else is going to be lost. What other fiber tract or sensory fiber tract is involved and sensory was in red. The other sensory fiber tract that was involved is this red one. And what is this red one? It is the anterolateral system. But where is this anterolateral system really coming from? It's coming from the left side of the body. And where is that loss going to be? It's again going to be below the level of lesion. So below the level of lesion, the anterolateral system is affected. But that system is carrying impulses from which side of the body? It is from the contralateral side. So, we will see signs and symptoms of anterolateral tract being affected, but that will be on the contralateral side and that is again below the level of lesion. So, I hope you've understood how, the, how we word this. So, the, the lesion is at C4. This is on the right side. The deficit scene, sensory deficit, deficit scene will be loss of stereognosis and uh, vibration and all that from the right side of the body which means it's on the ipsilateral side as the lesion. The, there will be loss of pain and temperature and crude touch because of these fibers but these are for the opposite side. So there will be contralateral loss of pain and temperature and that again will be seen below the level of lesion because anything from here all these fibers which come into the spinal cord they'll be all fine because they are going they are these are above the level so above c4 everything is fine as far as sensations go so you can see the sensory loss below the level of lesion it will be dorsal columns affected on the ipsilateral side the anterolateral system the signs and symptoms are seen on the contralateral side because this anterolateral system which is here is really carrying impulses from the left side now let's see the motor loss The motor loss is which fibers are affected. See these fibers which are on this side traveling down, they are fine. It's these fibers which are coming down and we'll call these the corticospinal fibers. So you can see that these corticospinal fibers are, they've already crossed. So they are already on this side and they are going to the cells of this side. So on the same side as the lesion, so you'll have on the same side as the lesion, you will, which means ipsilateral. The corticospinal fibers will be involved, which means it will be an upper motor neuron type of lesion. So the corticospinal fibers are involved on the ipsilateral side and so therefore it will be an upper motor neuron type of lesion. Now at C4, so the cut was made at the C4 segment of the spinal cord. So the cut was made at the C4 segment of the spinal cord. So at C4, what happens is that at C4, there will be all any fiber which travels at this point. It's either crossing or traveling at this point. You will have total band of anesthesia because these, you know, any fiber which is coming here, remember it's, it's traveling through the dorsal horn and it's coming in. So whether it's going up or it comes in here and synapses, these will be interrupted. So at the level of lesion, you'll have a total band of anesthesia due to the involvement of the dorsal horn. So this is how we are going to approach whether the deficit is going to be seen on the side of the lesion or it's going to be seen on the opposite side and whether the deficit is seen and what kind of deficit it is and that is usually below the level of lesion. So let us look now at the PowerPoint and here we have this uh, hemisection of the spinal cord and this hemisection of the spinal cord is known as the brown we often describe this brown C quad syndrome and this is really done for uh, more for didactic purposes just to sort of tell you 
and it's very rare that the spinal cord is is divided totally in such a fashion that it's sliced exactly in the middle but you know this just kind of so that you understand how the nervous system works that's why we we define this uh brown c quad syndrome so you can see that if this is the area that is affected so in the sensory tracts you can see the dorsal columns are affected and this is the lesion on the right side these dorsal columns are carrying impulses from the right side so therefore there will be ipsilateral loss of vibration stereognosis um, all of that then the anterolateral system which is present here in this this region which is the anterolateral system now this is carrying impulses from this side how is this tract here formed even though the tract is lying on the right side this tract is actually formed from fibers which cross over and form it so the effect is seen on the contralateral side so even though the lesion is on the right side the effect is seen on the contralateral side so that's why the when we say spinothalamic contralateral it doesn't mean that the spinothalamic tract is affected on the contralateral side the spinothalamic tract is affected on the right side but the the signs are seen on the opposite side so the loss of spinothalamic is on the contralateral side and then i already told you that the dorsal root at the level of lesion there's a band of cutaneous anesthesia so this is what this is showing you so there is loss of pain and temperature and um impaired tactile sense because the dorsal columns on this side are fine and this is because of the spinothalamic tract being affected uh, you have it on the contralateral side on the ipsilateral side there is loss of tactile discrimination all of this and this is due to dorsal columns in the motor tracts this here this is the point this area is where the motor the corticospinal fibers are affected so there is ipsilateral this is on the same side and it's upper motor neuron type of lesion and at the level of lesion so as it's sliced here these anterior horn cells so as you're slicing you you the anterior horn cells get affected so there is lower motor neuron lesion at the level of lesion so this is what happens in brown c quad syndrome so you must uh, uh, understand this really well so make sure you listen to this this part you know carefully and understand how the lesion is affected so again just so that you don't get confused the dorsal columns are affected on this side which is the side of lesion but they also what when we say ipsilateral we mean that the where are you going to see the signs and symptoms so the dorsal column is affected on this side and the signs and symptoms are also seen on the same side which is the ipsilateral side because these dorsal columns carry impulses from the right side of the body now the spinothalamic tract is affected on this side but it's carrying impulses from the left side of the body so that's why you have a contralateral loss of pain and temperature and so on and why do you have that because the spinothalamic tract is affected so that's the reason why you know you might get a little confused on this so we'll say when you talk of ipsilateral and contralateral that you're you're talking of the neurological deficit or the signs which you see as compared to the side of lesion so which side do you see the signs when you compare it to which side the lesion is let's look at another um motor and sensory loss and this is known as the anterior cord syndrome and this is usually seen if um the anterior spinal artery which supplies 2/3 of the spinal cord the anterior 2/3 of the spinal cord if uh, that is suddenly um uh, you know occluded then you this anterior cord syndrome is a sudden onset but sometimes you can have it um uh, because uh, uh the intervertebral disc or a vertebra may be fractured and then they push back so if you look if you look at the vertebral column so this is a vertebra this is the intervertebral disc in between and again this is another vertebra and then this is the spinous process in this fashion and then here is the spinal cord which lies in this part so if there's a fracture of the vertebral body or a fracture of the of the disc this will push backwards 
and it will push on the anterior part of the spinal cord and again that can cause the um, anterior cord syndrome. Now in this you can see this is the area that is affected and notice here that the dorsal columns which are present posteriorly, these dorsal columns are, they are spared. So what you see in the anterior cord syndrome is that now the corticospinal tract, so you can see the, this is the area of the corticospinal tract. So on both sides the corticospinal tract has gone so there will be a bilateral upper motor neuron deficit and it will be below the level of lesion because obviously these tracts are coming down this way on both sides so when this is the part if this is where all of this is affected any any part of this corticospinal above is okay but the part below is gone so the corticospinal tracts below the level of lesion can no longer uh, supply uh, the anterior horn cell so that's why you have an upper motor neuron deficit at the level of lesion because the anterior horn cell so you know if the spinal at this level these anterior horn cells on either side are affected so at the level of lesion there is a lower motor neuron type of paralysis and because this anterolateral system here this anterolateral system or the spinothalamic tract since these are affected on both sides so on both sides you'll have bilateral pain and temperature is lost but partial uh, touch is lost because you know remember fine touch was caused was uh, conveyed by the dorsal column so fine touch is still present so that that's why you don't have a total tactile tactile means touch you don't don't have a total tactile deficit you only have partial deficit and this again is kind of dissociated anesthesia so there's dissociated sensory loss or dissociated anesthesia and the reason being that pain and temperature is totally gone but some of touch is preserved so this is what you see in anterior cord syndrome another type of disease which affects both motor and sensory loss is this multiple sclerosis there's so much research going on in multiple sclerosis uh, this is a demyelinating disease in the central nervous system so this is demyelinating and it occurs in the central nervous system it's an autoimmune a disease and they think it's a possible mutation of the protein in the myelin which leads to that autoimmunity uh, some early infection with viruses in childhood uh, that makes people you know prone to uh, this autoimmune type uh, autoimmunity and that leads to multiple sclerosis uh, this is not anatomically selective that means you know demyelination can occur of ascending or descending tracts which means you may have both sensory and motor loss and um, if you uh, what happens here is there are plaques which are formed and you can see how these plaques are formed and they disrupt the myelin and hence they disrupt nerve transmission and where the myelin has been disrupted that area has been is usually replaced by scarring so you can see this is a damaged myelin sheath the common areas where this demyelination occurs is usually in the cervical region and again dysphagia may be one of the predominant symptoms upper brainstem area if the optic nerve is involved you get scotoma scotoma means it's a patchy kind of blindness so there's a patchy blindness so wherever the, that part of the optic nerve is involved there's patchy blindness there may be weakness of limbs and fatigue and that is again because of the lateral corticospinal tract being involved um, if there are any cerebellar tracts involved then you have ataxia which is incoordination and clumsiness if the dorsal columns are involved then naturally you'll have numbness loss of stereognosis vibration sense tingling if the anterolateral system is involved then you'll have pain and temperature loss um, and uh, this disease is prevalent both north and south of the equator and uh, you know remissions uh, may occur and they think that uh, usually the remissions are because the ex axonal membrane is being remodeled and more sodium channels are in, are uh, acquired and that leads to impulse transmission 
when relapses occur, uh, then the axon itself gets destroyed and nerve transmission is not possible at all. Nowadays, they are trying new treatments and one of the new treatments they are trying is something known as beta interferon. And this image shows you this uh, beta interferon. And in this disease, uh, what happens is that uh, these monocytes, they come and they destroy uh, myelin and make some myelin destroying agents. The way beta interferon does is it prevents this monocyte activation and also prevents them from making those myelin destroying agents. So that's why this beta interferon has found great use in the relapsing type of a multiple sclerosis. Otherwise, because it's an autoimmune disease, usually a, a lot of steroids are given in, in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. Now, in the peripheral nervous system, we have um, different uh, types of diseases. Again, you have what are known as polyneuropathies. Uh, these, this is general pathology of both the sensory and motor fibers. Usually, there are chronic vitamin deficiencies, hypothyroidism, and there's one called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is demyelination, which occurs in the peripheral nervous system. So in this Guillain-Barre syndrome, the demyelination occurs in the peripheral nervous, uh, 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 peripheral nervous system. And when the myelin sheaths are affected, the axons uh, remain intact. And usually this affectation is the distal segments get affected first, which is why you have this glove and stocking type of deficit. Glove and stocking type of deficit. And because the person does not feel any sensation on the hands and feet, they often have blisters on the hands and um, uh, feet. Uh, because, you know, when they touch something, they, they can't feel anything. Herpes zoster is a viral type uh, of disease. And in this, um, the, viral, uh, the virus travels along the nerve. There is inflammation of the nerve and... Uh, usually affects the dorsal root ganglia or the cranial nerve ganglia, which is why you see it along the dermatomal distribution. Uh, in the body, you, it's usually seen in the thoracic region, so you can see these blisters. And in the face, it's usually seen when the cranial nerve is affected, it's usually the fifth cranial nerve, so you see it along the distribution of the fifth cranial nerve. And severe pain and burning is felt along um, that area. So in Peripheral neuropathy, uh, when motor nerves are affected, obviously there is weakness at that, at that part. And then here we are looking at nerve root compression. Usually the nerve root compression is seen in the lumbar region. And um, if when seen in the lumbar region, when the intervertebral disc herniates so you know this is the point where the intervertebral disc will be when this herniate it tends to herniate in a posterolateral direction so it either goes directly posterior or it goes posterolateral so if it goes posterior you can see it will affect the spinal cord and that's where it causes uh, you know as it's going here that's where it will cause um, anterior cord syndrome if it occurs above the lumbar region and if it goes laterally you can see it will affect the nerve roots since it occurs mainly in the lumbar region, usually this intervertebral disc herniation affects the nerve roots because below L1, you only see the nerve roots. So when it goes posteriorly, it affects the nerve roots and there is pain uh, in the muscles which are supplied by the nerve that is being affected. And obviously, there will be, again, tingling and pain along the dermatome supplied, which is supplied by that spinal segment. Spondylosis is a condition where you will have some degenerative disease which is occurring in the vertebra and usually there are small spicules of bone spicules of bone which are known as osteophytes which develop and you can see as they are developing they kind of narrow the intervertebral foramen and then they impinge on the nerve so when they're impinging on that nerve then at that time um, you know depending on which nerve root is affected you will see the the deficit along that nerve root, both motor and sensory. 
So that finishes the spinal cord lesions. And again, once again, it's very, very important to have understood the spinal cord and the tracts well before you can actually, um, you know, work these lesions out for yourself. So don't memorize them, but try and work them out for yourself because you'll definitely be given an image or be told that the lesion occurs at this point and what you know what are the effects that you see so you should be able to work these out so it's pretty mathematical and logical once you know the tracks and the spinal cord 